This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making from two Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 187 and the launch date for the Rational Reminder 22 and 22 Reading Challenge is finally here. Today's the day, Ben, that we go live. It's very exciting. <laughs> it is exciting. So as people know, the, the objective of this podcast is to help improve listeners' lives um, by communicating ideas about sensible investing and financial decision-making. As you said, that's our domain. And clearly reading is a big part of that. And we thought that since reading is often on people's New Year's resolutions, that we would help people accomplish the goal of reading more. So we've created this community. It's, it's a website that's now live. This is going to be a, an environment where you can set your own goals and treat this as a commitment device to help you accomplish the goal of reading more. And there has been pretty incredible interest around this so far. Well, that's why and you did I, it, right? Didn't you just do a tweet or something? And then a bunch of people were, were interested in doing something about it? LinkedIn. So I've been talking about it for a few weeks and I've heard from a lot of friends and people that I know online that they're really looking forward to this. We also set up a 22 in 22 a recommended book list on the uh, the Rational Minor website. Anyway, so to get to get set up, we we um, signed with a company called Beanstack. So if you go to pwlcapital.beanstack.com, there's also an app for Beanstack, which I, I put on my iPhone. It loads up very easily. And then you have to find a site and just type in PWL and you'll see the community there. You can join in super easy to join, very easy to log books that you have read. There's also, you can log minutes that you're reading if you wish. You can put in reviews. It's not like our community where it's open for everyone to see. It, this is an app that's been built for mainly schools. So for, for privacy reasons, you have to connect with other friends. So if you want to connect with me, and I'll put this online and it will be in the show notes, my friend code is N62IPTX and Ben, yours is 7XWESMK. Again, we'll put them in the community. They will be online. If you want to connect, drop us a note. So I think Angelic is going to set up a thread in the community board where people can share their codes if you want to connect with others in the community. So, what, what happens if someone becomes your friend in this? Software. You get to, you get to see what they're reading, so everyone so should sign up and become your friend so they can see what you're reading. Correct, and I just like to be connected to other people. There's no place in there for chat just yet. I think Angelica is developing a relationship with Beanstack because I'm not sure there's a lot of corporate users of this, so I, I can see some improvements hopefully coming. But it, it's a nice, simple, effective app, and it's also really cool that Angelica has put in rewards. So as you reach certain levels, you're going to get badges, you're going to get uh, discount coupons in the uh, the merchandise store, and I think she has oh, some surprises cool. along the way too. Hmm. And then there's also the newsletter. So if you signed up already on our community board, there's a newsletter that will come out every quarter. So we'll see how that that rolls out. And if again you're looking for inspiration for books, check out the 22 and 22 book list on the Rational Reminder website. And as we've been saying for a few weeks now, we we wanted to invite special guests to help inspire people to read more. And I think we have a great guest. I know we have a great guest today joining us um, to, to launch this whole initiative. And it is Heather Reisman joined us. And if you've been to an Indigo store, you've certainly heard of Heather's picks. Well, today we speak with that Heather. So Heather's the founder and CEO of Indigo Books and Music, which is Canada's largest book gift, and especially toy retailer. She's also the co-creator of the Kobo Reading Device. Heather was appointed to the Order of Canada in 2019 and has also been inducted into the Canadian Business Hall of Fame. And she is, interestingly enough, a past governor of the Toronto Stock Exchange as well as McGill University. And, and you, you, you asked her this question in our conversation, she co-executive produced a couple of documentaries, including the Emmy Award winner, The Social Dilemma, as well as Fed Up. 
and she co-authored the book, Imagine It, a Handbook for a Happier Planet. Got lucky to meet Heather. She is a friend of a friend of mine who my friend's an avid listener and reader, so he was kind enough to make the introduction, and for that, we're very grateful. Anything, Ben, to add to the reading challenge? No, I think it's a, I think it's a great idea. And, uh, you know, I, I used to always make comments about how you read so much, and I don't know how you do it, um, but I've, I've kind of realized that I, I read a lot of books too. <laughs> <laughs> I just... I just do it differently than uh, yeah. than you do. I usually skip around and uh, well, one of the other people that we had a conversation with that'll come out in the future about the reading challenge, he kind of highlighted this for me that it's that there's not just one way to, way, one way to read a book. Um, anyway, so I have a a lot of books that I reference frequently when I'm thinking about other stuff or researching. Right. Um, I, I just don't sit down and read them. Beginning, getting to end like you often do and then write notes about it. That's what I always find so impressive about the way that you read is you take a book, you read it, you write your notes about it, and then you talk about it. And that always makes me feel like, you know, I don't do that, but I do consume a lot of books just differently. Right. So I'm, I'm looking forward to sharing that in this, uh, in this community as well. So we had a couple of really nice reviews lately. Maddie left a review saying it's an amazing podcast. It's a must listen for anyone who's looking for to further their financial education and elevate their investing strategies. She goes on kindly to say that we break down topics with fresh insight and perspectives as well as practical advice. So thank you for that. And Jonas said, this is the best investment podcast out there. I wish they took listener questions. Well, we try to take some listener we do. questions. We, we do. We do take them. We take them and lots of our content is informed by the discussions in the rational reminder community, which is sort of an implicit listener question, but we're happy to take explicit listener questions as well. <laughs> yep. Upcoming guest next week, we have Islet Fishbach. She's the author of Get It Done, Surprising Lessons from the Science of Motivation. And also her book is on her 22 suggested book list. Phenomenal interview. She was just terrific. Two weeks after that, we'll welcome Leonard Mladenov, who is a longtime friend of ours, actually, and author of the recently released book, Emotional, How Feelings Shape Our Thinking. And then in five weeks' time, London Business School's finest professor, Alex Edmonds, will join us. He's the author of the book, Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit, which was chosen by the Financial Times as one of the best books of 2020. I thought we'd also give a heads up on some of the guests coming up that will join us in the Us episodes. So these will be short interviews like the one we had today with Heather. So coming up in three, two weeks' time is Neil Pasricha, who's the author of the Awesome series of books, which I'm sure many listeners have read. He's also the host of the podcast Three Books. And then two weeks after that, Morgan Housel is going to come back and join us. So he's a past guest and author of the massive bestseller, The Psychology of Money. And that book seems to show up on everyone's recommended list. And then a couple of weeks after that, our very good friend and frequent guest, Larry Swedro, is going to join us. And I thought he'd be interesting to talk about this because he's both a prolific reader and he has summaries he puts out in all the books he reads and he ranks them every year. But he's also a prolific author. So I think that's a good, good combination. As always, connect with us on Twitter, uh, hashtag Rash Reminder and CP313 on Peloton. I'm on LinkedIn if you want to connect with me. Ben, you're on there, but you're not active on there. And here's a recommendation for you. Anyone who liked the series Ray Donovan, I found out about this on the weekend. There's a Ray Donovan movie that just came out. It's on Crave. I didn't know how they could keep the story going after the series, but they sure did. And wow, what a movie. Fantastic. Never heard of it. I've got one. Tell you what I've been watching in the evenings. <laughs> watching the background while you're working your laptop? Nope. Uh, nope. Actually watching. Uh, you're going to laugh though. Uh, Gary Gensler, uh, who's currently leading the SEC. He taught a course on, uh, on cryptocurrencies at MIT prior to uh, being at the SEC. He's a very impressive guy. Um, I mean, he talks a little bit about, about his personal background uh, and professional background in, in the early lectures, um, but they're they're quite good. So I've been I've been watching those. It's free MIT Open Courseware. Really? Um, so it's video lectures, but it's also got the slides, the readings, like everything. It's all on the MIT website. So that's been uh, 
how I've been spending my uh, my evenings. Very cool. That's interesting. Okay. Is that good for the intro? Good. All right. Let's go with episode 187. Welcome to episode 187 of the Rational Mother Podcast. Okay. Shockingly, we'll kick this off with a quick book review. <laughs> shockingly. Shockingly. <laughs> Hey, these are great books. And today, man, today was really good. This is a book I absolutely loved. Uh, people know that I've been a little obsessed with learning about how organizations and teams work. And you can see that in the recent book reviews. So today's book is called The Culture Code by Daniel Coyle. And yes, this book is on the 22 and 22 list. Simply a phenomenal book. I loved it because it tried to answer a simple question, which is why do some organizations become greater than the sum of their parts? So the point of this book, as I understood it is, the success of your company rests not on the intellect or the experience of your team, but rather in the ability for the team to work together as a single unit. Sounds simple enough, but he put together this incredible framework and as you said in the beginning, I've been able to extract this framework, kind of boil it down and put it into um, my collection of notes. So I've been collecting these notes for years about all kinds of different topics, and I loved the way he broke down so many things. So I want to take you through some of the key takeaways from this book as I understood it. So his point is that successful group cultures, so if your team's going to come together as a unit, you need to have a great culture, so the culture code. So the successful group culture is built on three critical things, safety, vulnerability, and purpose. That is the big takeaway. So safety is what he calls the cornerstone of interconnectivity. So he says you have to have honest and open communication. People have to be able to feel that they can speak out regardless of the hierarchy of your organization. People need to feel valued, that they belong, and that they're comfortable in the group. This triggers effective open communication. This creates chemistry, and this chemistry causes people to be so engaged that they go above and beyond their expectations. This is not to say that you're working people to death. It just means you get a different level of engagement that they end up being better driven at those moments through the day to be more connected and deliver better work and more fulfilling work for them. And it also means that people will stick together in the most volatile of times. So he says, as a leader to create safety, you should listen actively with full attention to the immediate conversations and watch for your attention waning somewhere else. Deliver lots of small courtesies. Always exaggerate your appreciation. Give cues to your teammates' future and discuss long-term goals. Encourage speaking up. Promote a very vocal workforce. Have lots of interactions. And in group discussions, really invest in the exchange and orient the exchange of ideas towards the future. Number two, vulnerability. And this is what uh, the author calls the foundation of teamwork. So this is the exposure, the demonstration of your own personal weakness to your team, followed by a request for help. This develops trust. So this leads to open and honest communication and builds a better, stronger team and creates better solutions. So you have to make sure your team feels secure enough to be able to be vulnerable in that environment. So ask questions, gently challenge, don't just simply give teammates the answer. Let them work and, and figure out the answers. He also says be candid with feedback, but not brutal. So third piece, the third part of the foundation is purpose. And this is what the author calls the core of decision making. So the purpose is the central message that guides the direction of the company. Why do we do what we do? What is our mission? So you always have to give your team and your teammates clear perspective on the role of their work, always give clear priorities, help discover obstacles on the path towards the goal. And there's so many benefits to this. And again, it goes back to what I said earlier, when team members understand their role in the overall purpose, they'll put more energy into creating solutions and they're more fulfilled, but it's that creating this energy at times of the day when it's the right thing needed at the right time. So people aren't just on autopilot. Autopilot doesn't go very far. So this creates that energy through the day. People end up learning faster because they're more engaged. They'll take what they learn and apply it to solutions quicker and be more fulfilled. Um, also, he says that the purpose is not clear, 
and there's no standard, then there's no standard for people to live up to. There's no reason to perform if there's no clear purpose. People may misconstrue the reasons for certain decisions or reasons. Lack of clarity equals confusion. Confusion equals frustration and anger. Clearly, that's not the kind of environment you want. So those are the three main foundation pieces. My last two takeaways, and this applies to work that you and I do. He talks about the difference of team environments in two main different types of work environments. So if you're in a high proficiency environment, which is what he calls it. So for example, our world, delivering a technical service delivery, financial planning investments, that's a high proficiency world. Basically, failure is not an option. So you have to create an environment where team members can make quick and appropriate decisions while working as a singular unit. So you're reliant on other people to deliver high quality, technical, deliberate, accurate advice and repetition and feedback are crucial to make sure you get in that expertise, much like you're a surgeon, right? There's no creative work in being a surgeon necessarily, right? So you want to continue to explain that person's role in the overall purpose of that deliberate service delivery unit. The other type of environment is a high creative environment, such as creating a new service, a new product, or even take this book challenge. This book challenge that we're doing is an experiment. If it goes great, great. If it doesn't go great, well, it's not a life or death type thing. So in a high creative environment, you want to create a team culture where failure is necessary and that helps to develop a high level of creativity. You want to create a space where people can discover their work for themselves. Even if the author says 90% of the ideas fail, the other 10% can lead to incredible advancements. So you have to make sure that people have autonomy, try things, fail often, learn from failures and own the process. So embrace failure and learn from it. So those are my key takeaways from a phenomenal book. Anyone that's managing a team or is in a team type environment, I highly recommend this book. All makes sense. It's interesting when you read a lot of these types of books, they all kind of weave together. I just thought this author did a great job of framing it in a way that, you know, you can remember those three parts of foundation, these two types of team environments, right? So you keep those notes front and center. And I think they can really help people. It, it definitely sounds like a, a, a re-articulation, or maybe this was the original, I don't know the timeline, but it, it, it definitely sounds like other similar books on managing sure. managing teams that you've talked about. Like Daniel Pink's Master Autonomy Purpose. There's Drive, similar yeah. themes, right? Anyways, you had cool. a, a news and update story you wanted to share. You put that in there. I just put the notes in to talk about it because I thought it was worthwhile. But you, 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 you selected this story. Uh, Facebook's price drop uh, wiped out $232 billion of value in one day, which set a record for- Doesn't blow your mind. Stock market history. Like in a day. It's a lot of value. <laughs> it's a lot of value. <laughs> uh, but that, that's, that's what I want to talk about. When you put that in there, because everyone's like, whoa, this is crazy. You know, it's a, it's a record. It's, but it's not really unexpected. Like you have these massive companies, um, uh, stuff, c companies are getting more valuable uh, th than they've been in the past, which you would expect just by adjusting for inflation. Like it's not like that's that's crazy. And we talked uh, years ago now in, in old episodes about how the, the level of concentration in the stock market is not uh, that unprecedented. Like it's it kind of always goes like that. But anyway, so these companies are big, uh, but they're growth stocks. They've got high prices. What happens to what happens to growth stocks? I, I, I just took my notes from an old episodes where we, the, the one about uh, where do stock returns come from, I think it was called, but I, I thought it was worth reiterating those. Um, and this is from a Fama and French paper. Uh, but growth stocks tend to have negative convergence in their price relative to their book value. The, the price to book falls because growth companies don't always remain highly profitable with low expected returns, low, low discount rates. Um, like why is a growth company a growth company? Uh, well, because it is prof profitable and it's got a, a, a business that the market has deemed to be relatively safe, safe and stable. Therefore, it has a low discount rate. Exactly. So that gives it a very high price when you combine those two things uh, together. But on average, the, the price to book declines after stocks move to the growth category 
And the positive average rates of capital gain of growth portfolios traces back to increases in book equity uh, that more than offset the declines in price to book. Uh, so they actually decrease in their valuation, but they also grow their, their book equity after being added to the, to the growth portfolio. Um, so these companies are, are, they're seeing their fundamentals grow, but their prices, their relative prices aren't rising. And in fact, they're, they're falling after being added to the growth portfolio. So Fahm and French in, in the paper that we're referencing here, uh, they offer the explanation that companies that are allocated to the value versus growth portfolios tend to be at opposite ends of the profitability spectrum. Growth companies tend to be highly profitable and fast growing and value companies are less profitable and growing less, less rapidly. And then that's what gives the the differences in relative in relative price. Um, so that's all that that's all pretty intuitive, I think. Um, but the the thing that happens is that that's not going to stay true forever. Uh, competition from other companies for the growth stocks, uh, or just exhausting the most profitable growth avenues, tends to eventually erode the high profitability uh, growth of of growth companies. Uh, so over time, some growth companies stop being as highly profitable and they stop growing their profits as as quickly and their low cost of capital uh, tend to increase and that results in, in them either dropping out of the growth portfolio or just having their relative price uh, decrease. And for value, it tends to be the opposite. Uh, relative prices tend to increase after value companies get added to the to the value portfolio because some value companies restructure their business and improve their profitability um, and, and decrease their, their cost of, of capital. So this, this idea of basically mean reversion in, in uh, relative prices is called convergence. That's what Fama and French called it, which is basically predictable changes in profitability and growth uh, and related changes in expected returns that occur because growth stocks are not growth stocks forever and <laughs> value stocks are not uh, value stocks forever. So that's, you know, what, what, what did we see with, with Facebook? Well, their, uh, profitability forecast, their revenue forecast dropped and their cost of capital probably went up. Well, it definitely went up price, price dropped. Um, but that's not, that's something that happens to growth stocks. It's funny, you know, like we, with what was it two years ago, maybe or a year ago that, um, the media was getting so excited about these, these huge stocks with the, you know, the Fang stocks and their, their returns are just so good. And, and the prices kept going up and we kept trying to give the, uh, you know, rational perspective, like, you know, this doesn't happen forever. And it's always, well, this time is different. Well, it was until it wasn't, which is the way it always is. <laughs> but for it to be different, it means that the investors have to keep pricing it to expect that high return going forward, which just doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, yeah. Revenues can continue growing or profits can continue growing um, to the point where, you know, the company becomes bigger than the whole global economy, but that doesn't make sense. Right. Um, so that, that avenue doesn't work. And then the other avenue is that the relative price can continue increasing forever. But again, that that doesn't work. At some point, people won't pay that much for expected growth. Um, and eventually things turn around as, as the data show. But the disconnect that I think so many people make is, yes, you have the company doing what the company will do in terms of profitability, but over here, you also have competition on what the people are willing to pay for that stock. So right. that mechanism is pricing what the company is doing. So you can't just say, well, it's a great company, therefore I want to own it. Well, no, it's what are you paying for that future growth? Like how is the market pricing it? Yeah, well, it's like what we talked about in, a, I don't know when it was, a few episodes ago about how a, a great company is not necessarily a great investment. It depends right. what you pay for the expected cash flows. Anyway, I, I thought this was interesting just because I remember I remember covering, like we did CSI videos on this. We, t we covered it on the podcast about how well it looks as if these stocks are going to continue growing at the crazy rate that they've been growing forever. That's not how it works. <laughs> And we, there, there's historical precedent for massive companies that are in winner-take-all situations in their yep. industry, and they end up being enormous uh, in absolute terms and uh, relative to uh, other other stocks in the market. And 
yeah, well, it, it doesn't it it doesn't last forever. And in fact, those largest stocks tend to have market trailing returns after they have become the largest stocks. So there's two things going on there, working against these companies. There's the the size, which is negatively re- related to expected returns, but there's also the relative price. Yeah, and uh, those mega cap high price stocks have low expected returns. Well, now Facebook's the good news. <laughs> The good news is that Facebook has higher expected returns now. Right. <laughs> so that's good. That's exciting. Uh, yeah. Wanted to say a couple of things about the Talking Sense cards that we had with uh, Andrew Hallam. We got lots of good feedback on that episode, um, by the way, on on mm-hmm. YouTube and also on the um, on the Rational Market community. So that was nice. Nice to see. A- Andrew's very enjoyable to talk to. Uh, one of the talking sense cards was asking whether sports teams should be owned by individuals or by the city's players and fans. And I didn't know what to say. And I said, it sounded like (laughs) communism and and that it probably wouldn't work very well. (laughs) That, that wasn't a very smart thing to say. Um, people in the community pointed out that there are sports teams, in fact, that are owned by their fans. It's not exactly the way that the talking sense card ask the question, but it's still interesting. So I wanted to mention it. Um, so FC Barcelona, uh, which is, uh, the soccer team, I think with the highest, the highest revenue in the world, uh, and the green Bay Packers, these are just two big examples. There are are other, other examples. Um, the green Bay Packers an NFL team, they're both structured as not-for-profit organizations, uh, where the fans can become members and own the team. Now, what does ownership mean? That's a that's a different question that I'll touch on uh, in a second. And it's also interesting to note that this structure, the not-for-profit ownership structure, is not allowed in in either of the leagues that these teams compete in anymore. Uh, they're they're both grandfathered in because that's how they were owned. Uh, I guess going going back very far. Um, hmm. For FC Barcelona, I kind of just poked around at their structure when I saw somebody comment about this in the in the community because I'd never. I never thought about it. Uh, so the members legally own the organization, but it's not for profit. So there's no cash flows. Like they don't own future cash flows like you would in a, in a stock. And they don't have any control or input except for electing a president for the organization every four years. And then once the president is elected, hmm. uh, they basically have full discretion over the operations of the, of the team. So it's not clear what exactly the the members own other than maybe the feeling of ownership and and the vote of course which is worth something um and then tom tom talks uh, it was diego that wrote about fc barcelona and their teams in the community and, and tom talks uh in the rational matter community pointed out that the in the nfl they equally share revenues across all the teams so his point is that the the packers being able to have this common ownership structure, the not-for-profit ownership structure may not tell us that that results in a successful team or can be viable for a successful team because in the case of the NFL, um, the most other teams are owned by individuals or small groups of owners. And because the profit is shared equally, the Packers don't have to do anything. They don't have to be a great business because they're getting an equal share of revenue. So it could be the, the much more capitalist structure of the other teams that's making the league successful, which is therefore mm. taking that team uh, team with it. Anyway, I, I, that, that that card totally threw me off, and uh, it was interesting to see the the feedback that we that we got about it. So it 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 uh, it, it, it was successful in, in getting me to think about something new, which I think is one of the points of those cards. Great follow up. Ready for the main topic? So you've done a little bit of work on this one. This could be one of my favorite pieces of research you've ever done. Really? I think this stuff is so cool. Wow. You don't usually say that. It's a big deal. But it links back to so much of, I think, the evolution of our learning over the past three, four years. And you pulled it all together really nicely here. Well, it it, kind of happened last week. I've been working on this paper, um, and this section was not previously in the paper, 
but I've been working on this paper on, I don't really know what to call it yet, but it's like all of the, all of the, how to make a financial decision, basically all, all of the non, non-financial considerations in making a financial decision. Like if you're just a, if you're a, a robot, um, you might invest your money and not spend it, save, save a hundred percent of your income, except for what is required for basic necessities and invest in the riskiest portfolio possible to maximize wealth. Maybe that's what a robot would do depending on its utility function, I guess. Um, but for people, that's not typically the right thing to do. So what are the inputs to a financial decision that people should think about? So that's the paper that I've been working on. And then we talked to Ilette Fishbach last week and her whole thing is motivation science and pursuing goals. And after talking to her, I kind of realized that tying, tying the whole uh, paper together is, is that, is, is setting goals. Like how do you actually put this stuff into, into action? Like you have to figure out what, what your goals are. And in reading Ilet's book to prepare to, to speak with her, um, th- there's this thing in motivation science that, that we'll touch on in this segment called uh, a goal system. And I don't know if it's the, the engineer in me or what, but it's, it's, it's a picture of goals and each goal has means or sub goals attached to it. And drawing it out, uh, and there's some other language that goes along with that too that, that I'll touch on in a minute, but drawing it out lets you figure out which means, which is basically the activities, like which stuff that you do in a given day should you do to maximize the attainment of all of your goals. It's like, oh, wow, that's a that's like an optimization problem. That's that's kind of cool. <laughs> so anyway, got me interested in, in, uh, in goals. So I started looking into it and wrote a whole section for the paper and thought we would uh, thought we would talk about it. My, my other idea was to, to do emerging markets, uh, like how, should you overweight emerging markets relative to market cap? So we'll still cover that eventually. I know people wanted to, um, would be interested in that, but I just spent a bunch of time working on this, so this is, this is what we got. Uh, okay, so goals-based financial planning. It's a big deal. Uh, that's that's kind of how uh, financial products are sold, but it's also how uh, fee-based financial advisors operate typically where it's like, okay, what, what are, what are your goals? That's the question that a financial planner will often ask. Uh, the FP Canada St- uh, standards council, which is the financial planning association in, uh, in Canada, and they've got a standards council. Uh, so they explain an effective financial planning recommendation properly implemented will help the client meet their financial goals and needs while helping to optimize their financial position. Great. That makes a lot of sense. And, and big financial goals. Like if you think about financial planning case studies, for example, when you're doing the CFP, you have case studies. Um, so what, what are financial planners thinking about? It's often stuff like retiring. I want to retire at age 55 with, you know, $8,000 per month in income. Um, I want to, I want to uh, buy a bigger house. I want to pay for my kids university education or, or I want to buy a boat or a cottage or whatever. Uh, those are common financial goals that people will will come up with and de- defining goals is important um, and prioritizing goals in the planning process is also important. There's an interesting paper that David Blanchett had in 2015 where he showed using a, uh, a, a utility model and some Monte Carlo type uh, analysis. I think he found a one, a 1.6% a benefit equivalent to a 1.6% alpha by properly funding um, goals, like funding the right goals in the right in the right order at the at the right time. So it's a real benefit to, to setting goals and, and approaching them uh, strategically. And that's that's a math problem, like what David Blanchett did in his paper is a, is a math problem. But the part that that I I, I was stuck on, and I kind of realized speaking with Ilette and reading her book that. This is kind of what the paper I'm working on, working on is about, is what goals should you set? And I think that's really hard. And it is really hard. And there's, there's research showing that it's really hard that I'll, that I'll talk about in a, in a second. Um, pe- people aren't good at knowing what will make them happy in the future. We've talked about that many times in the podcast. And there's a whole bunch of that type of information in the paper that I'm working on. Um, but what I learned more recently is that they're also deficient at generating the possible set of objectives for the decisions that they make. So if you set somebody down 
even if they do know about all the, the happiness literature and what, what, is, uh, what are the contents of a good life, even if they do know that information, and most people don't, but even if they do, if you sit them down and ask them, uh, what, what are your objectives? What are your goals? They won't give you, on average, a comprehensive list. Um, and the, the way that that's been studied is if you give somebody ask somebody what their objectives are and then later show them a master list of objectives that like aggregated from other people, for example, um, then people will, after the fact, identify a whole bunch of those objectives as as important or more important than the uh, objectives that they independently right. identified. Which is crazy, right? And there's a paper by Bond, Carlson, and Keeney, 2008 paper, uh, where they where they found that. And then it, they followed up in a 2010 paper uh, and, and they said that it, the, the, the shortcoming in identifying objectives, it, it seems to come from not thinking broadly enough about the range of relative, relevant objectives and then not thinking deeply enough to articulate every objective within the range that, that was considered. So they ran some experiments and found that that was the source of the, of the issue. So the, the point is, Starting with the question, whether with a financial planner or on your own, uh, what are your goals? Or even sitting down and writing out what are your goals, it's, uh, it's deficient in, in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, so how do you actually do that? How do you, how do you identify objectives? Uh, and this is assuming, right, that, uh, that you, you are familiar with uh, the, the literature on, on the contents of a good life, um, which is a whole other that's a whole other thing to, to cover in a future episode, um, or to recover because we kind of we've covered it before. Yeah. But um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that we didn't cover then that is in this paper that I'm working on. But anyway, uh, so setting financial goals is is pretty much the process of defining a good life for yourself when you think about it. Like money is money is just a tool, time is just a tool. Um, but you, to set goals, you have to decide what. What do I want my life to look? I mean, that's what goals are. Um, but we know people are going to struggle to set those goals. Uh, so following the, the prescriptive implications from the Bond, Carlson, and Kinney 2010 paper that I mentioned, uh, they say that you should sit down, generate your list of objectives without outside help. Step one. Now you know that that initial list is going to be deficient on average. So the next step is to revisit the task of identifying the objectives, but with a stated challenge of approximately doubling the number of objectives identified. Okay. And there's a, there's a bunch of empirical work that they cite in their paper showing that having that challenge uh, results in people giving better answers and extracting better information from, from people. And the doubling was also scientific um, based on the number of additional objectives people typically identify. Um, so it's like 30 to 50% more or something. So they suggest this is a simple rule, double, double your initial set of objectives. Um, yeah, so that's, and, and the, the other big one is to offer a categorical format for generating the additional perspectives. So still initially sit down and do, do what are your objectives? but then being offered categories and saying, given these categories, can you identify any other objectives that would be important to you? And the idea that I had in reading their paper was that using something like the, the PERMA model from Seligman that we've talked about in the past, the model for well-being, uh, that, that, that seems like a pretty good starting point for, for categories, uh, for setting objectives. Uh, and then in, in the Bon Carlson Keeney paper, they also talk about how if there is a master list of objectives available, it should be consulted, but only after deliberating about your own objectives um, and then using the challenge and category tools to augment them. Uh, Morningstar actually has a paper where they talk about a lot of this stuff and they, they do have in that paper a master list, which I believe, if I remember correctly from reading the paper, was from actual um, uh, surveys where they did this type of exercise and, and use it to create the, the master list. Uh, interestingly, as I was working on this, uh, Phil in the Rational Reminder community started a wiki post 
where he references the Morningstar paper and he started a list of master goals or a master list of goals that other people can add to. So the R community can have a community generated master list of uh, cool. goals, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, but I think it could be augmented by adding in categories to the master list. But anyway, um, the Morningstar list, th this is the other thing. I think there's a lot of work to be done here. Um, just when you think about the research on the contents of a good life and then uh, see the list that Morningstar has put together. Uh, number one, to be better off than my peers. <laughs> Seems like an odd goal. Now, now, now that's true. That's very important to people uh, empirically, but I don't know if it should be. Uh, should, I guess, is a difficult word. But uh, number two, to pay for personal self-improvement, to go back to school or learn a new skill. Okay. Uh, to experience the excitement of investing. Ugh, really? Ooh, yeah. Uh, to start a new business, to buy a yeah. house, to help pay for kids, college education. Anyway, personally not a fan of this master list. Um, apologies to the authors at Morningstar of this of this paper. Uh, and and it's some, something that I, I, I don't know how we'll approach it yet, but I think it would be very cool to build a, and maybe it's through the Rational Minder community, maybe working off of what Phil started maybe it's doing uh surveys with clients cameron over a few years and developing a master list of like what are people's actual uh goals anyway uh, there's a lot of work interesting work that can be done can be done there uh okay so w what is an effective goal Th that's the, the the next big question um once we figured out what the main objectives are and develop that list for for a person what is an effective goal look like and this is where I let's stuff started to become pretty important in the stuff that I was thinking about um, so financial decisions are typically pretty long-term decisions like it's not an immediate reward that you're going to get from um, saving money for example or investing uh, or, or waiting to buy something or whatever but anyway financial decisions tend to be long-term just by their by their nature um, uh, effective goals, and this is from Eilet's book, effective goals are statements of a desirable state, not the means to get there, and they're abstract. And she she says that based on the, the literature in motivation science, when goals are defined that way, uh, they're powerful motivational tools that pull you in the direction that you want to go. So the language, the framing of how the goal is defined is is very important. Uh, defining a goal in terms of its desired state, like like having more time for leisure activities is my example, uh, instead of its explicit costs, like spending money on a house cleaner, uh, increases the motivation to achieve the goal. Uh, when, when it's framed as a desired future state rather than the means, there, there's a powerful effect on motivation and there's empirical work from Ayelet Fishbach and, uh, and a co-author supporting that. M most of the statements that I'll make here are supported by uh, experimental, whatever you call it in psychology, empirical stuff. Um, abstract goals put the focus on the meaning of your actions, which makes the actions themselves seem less like a chore. Uh, thinking about goals in the abstract makes people more likely to exercise self-control in their actions toward a goal. Hmm. And again, Fujita and Carnival 2012 is the, the supporting literature there. Now there is a fine line where goals can become too abstract uh, if they can't be linked to a specific set of actions. So if there's no clear path to achieving the goal, people revert to fantasizing instead of taking action. And fantasizing, again empirically, uh, about a goal seems to be negatively related to goal attainment. So if you're not thinking about the specific actionable steps or if you can't because of the way the goal has been defined and all you can do is fantasize about the desired future state, it's negatively related to attaining the goal as opposed to positively related. Uh, and then another big consideration, this one is interesting because we've talked about anti-goals in the past. Um, so another big consideration is whether you should use, uh, approach goals, which is something that you want or avoidance goal, which is like the anti-goals that we've, we've talked about in the past. Um, and, and choosing between the two, our understanding for a while was kind of that, um, avoidance goals are better. Anti-goals are better because, they eliminate a lot of the issues with our weak affective forecasting abilities. We're not good at knowing what's going to make us happy in the future. So instead think about anti-goals was 
um, what we understood for a while. But Ayelet gives a much more nuanced perspective on that. Uh, so she says that choosing between uh, choosing between the two, and it's crazy, right? We're talking about the language. What words do you use to describe your goal? But there's all the science behind how that actually does make a big difference and whether you're going to achieve it or not. Uh, okay, so choosing between approach and avoidance goals, she says it comes down to the nature of the goal and the nature of the person. So it's not, you, you can't say it's, it's not one size fits all. Uh, avoidance goals are, are most useful in preventing harm and escaping danger, while approach goals are better suited for achieving a positive desired future state. Uh, avoidance goals are more urgent and less pleasant, and approach goals are easier to stick with in the long term because they are, because they are pleasant. Um, so some people, so this is the kind of predisposition, which, which approach should you take to, to setting the goal? Some people have a strong behavioral approach system, while others have a strong behavioral inhibition system. And those with a strong behavioral approach system will tend to do better with approach goals. Whereas those with a strong behavioral inhibition system will tend to do better with avoidance goals. Now people listening, how do I know? What, which <laughs> one am I? So in, in her book, Ayelet gives uh, four statements. Uh, statement one, when I want something, I usually go all out and get it. Statement two, when I see an opportunity for something I like, I get excited right away. Statement three, I worry about making mistakes. And statement four, criticism or scolding hurts me quite a bit. So if you agree with statements one and two, you're expected to do better with approach goals. Right. If you agree with statements three and four, you're expected to do better with avoidance goals. Um, and, and in addition to that, avoidance goals are better suited to stopping an unwanted behavior like shopping online or spending leisure time scrolling on, on Instagram because that's more urgently stopping an unwanted uh, behavior. Uh, but in, in her book, Ilet says that in general, even though it's not one size fits all, if we were to generalize, approach goals tend to be the better choice when you're thinking long term and kind of defining a good a good life for uh, the future. So in, in general, under most circumstances, approach goals are, are more motivating than avoidance goals, but you've got to know yourself and you've got to know the specific objective that you're trying to achieve. And it makes a, it makes a material difference on, on average, like in the, in the data, it makes a material difference on motivation to attain the goal, which, uh, which is just fascinating to think about. Uh, okay. So setting goals is, is, uh, is work. Setting goals is work, which is crazy because <laughs> we haven't even started going, uh, going toward achieving them yet. Um, but then, which is the real work actually doing the, taking the actions to, to achieve the goal. Uh, so again, this is from Ilet's book. She, she talks about how to, to turn a goal into action, you've got to create challenging, measurable, actionable, and self-set targets. Uh, so challenging or think about it as opt optimistic targets with minor consequences for failure, which was important, uh, increases motivation and execution toward desired actions. And that's uh, Zhang and Fishbach, 2010, was the study supporting that statement. Uh, me measurable tar targets, uh, I think this one's just pretty intuitive. They're, they're necessary as a feedback loop to monitor progress. If you can't measure what you're doing, you're not going to know how, how you're doing. And then actionable is kind of an extension of measurable, at least is the way that I understood it. Uh, actionable targets are practically useful. And in Eilat's book, she gives... Uh, I think I can't remember this is her example or my example, but it, whatever, it'd be similar either way. Um, it, the, the example is, is exercising for 30 minutes each day. That's measurable and actionable. Burning 500 calories each day is measurable, but it's hard to measure, right? It's hard to measure exactly how many calories that you burned. So that's less actionable. Um, and then self set targets. This one is really interesting. They maintain your sense of freedom and we know control is important to to humans or the feeling of having control. Uh, when people are told what to do, they're more likely to rebel against the instruction to regain their sense of freedom. And that's old psychology research from Brem, 1966. Uh, in a financial, financial planning contest, I found this really interesting. We talked to Eilat about this in, in next week's episode, um, but a planner might tell a client what they need to do to accomplish their goals. And we, we kind of chatted with Eilat about what, what would the, what's an alternative and uh, we, we kind of decided that 
Uh, if you have the client partake in the analysis that arrives at the required action, so like figuring, having the client figure out how much they can save uh, or spend to satisfy a goal, um, and then maybe put modifying the goal to suit their ability to to save or, or, or spend would be more effective than, I mean, it makes sense when you think about it. Like, can you imagine just, no, you have to save this much money. That's crazy. Um, but a, according to the motivation science literature, um, that, that second approach would be more effective than prescribing the amount needed to, to satisfy a goal. So self-set targets is an important part of, um, of reaching, reaching goals. And, and then meeting targets shouldn't feel like a chore. And this is another one that's intuitive, but I don't know. I, I hadn't thought about it like this, really. Go goals shouldn't feel like chores. The, the, the means to achieving a goal shouldn't feel like chores. Uh, intrinsic motivation to pursue the means toward a goal is one of the best predictors of adherence. And that's Fishbach and Woolley 2016 where they found that, but, uh, but it, I mean, it just makes, makes sense. I don't know how much evidence we need to support that one. Um, so of course the implication for setting goals is, is important. Like if you don't enjoy the means or if the mean, and this is an, another nuance, if, if the means doesn't feel like it's accomplishing the goal. So maybe you don't love doing the activity. But if the activity gives you immediate feedback that you're moving toward your goal, uh, it, it, it'll feel, it'll feel good. Um, so if you don't have either of those things, it'll be more challenging to stick with, to stick with it. Uh, now in long-term financial planning, it's tricky, right? Cause the reward is very far in the future and savings, not always fun. Um, so you, you would call that ex ex extrinsic motivation. There's no pleasure in saving. Well, for some people there is. Uh, so you, you can make activities feel more intrinsically motivated if they achieve many goals. So that could be setting quarterly targets or something like that, uh, for savings amounts maybe, or, or even monthly targets. I don't know. Um, or, or when the activity is, is fun in and of itself, uh, then it's more intrinsically motivating. So it, it, in, in goal pursuit, it's, it is really important to remember. And I think in, in financial planning, especially this gets lost often, but in goal pursuit, we got to remember that people get pleasure from making progress toward a goal. And this is research from Davidson, 1998, uh, the progress principle is how you could summarize it, but we, we get pleasure from making progress toward a goal. And that's called pre goal attainment, positive affect and from achieving the goal. And that's post goal attainment, positive affect, but the progress toward the goal offers continued pleasure along the way each step toward progress while the post goal pleasure is short lived. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to pursuing goals, I think it, it, it truly is more about the, the, the journey, more about the, the daily experience of moving toward the goal than it is about actually achieving it. But I think that's the, people get stuck in the trap of I'll be happy later. I'm going to do this miserable thing for the next 10 years, whatever the miserable thing is to achieve this goal that I want. Um, thinking that you'll be happy in the future, but that it ties back into the happiness stuff. People are bad at predicting what's going to make them happy in the future. And then specific to goal attainment, post goal attainment is short lived and they it can adapt. actually, uh, yeah, yeah. You, you adapt to the, to the new, uh, state. Uh, okay. So that's, we, we've kind of talked about how, how to set goals, how to pursue goals. Um, and then the last piece is organizing them. How do you take all this information and turn it into something actionable? Um, go goals are almost certainly going to pull in different directions. You think about a, a, a good life has a lot of different ingredients, but um, they can be in conflict with each other, like spending time with family and and career. I mean, that's one, one example. Uh, balancing the means to achieving multiple goals is it's a pretty complex task, especially with a lot of goals. So I think it, it, it makes sense to do some planning. Um, I haven't done this yet. I haven't built my own goal system, but I'm going to do it. Even though I've talked about the fact that I don't have goals before I let kind of told us, well, you guys clearly do have goals cause you're doing a podcast. You don't, you don't just roll out of bed every morning and, and, uh, manage to accidentally do a podcast. Um, and I think she's right. I probably do have goals. I just haven't taken the time to articulate them anyway. So I, I will build a goal system. And hopefully a template that'll go in this in this paper that I've alluded to. Uh, so goal system, 
uh, that you got the top level abstract goals and that's they're, they're served by sub sub goals or, or means some of the means are multi-final meaning they serve more than one goal some are equifinal meaning that they are one of multiple means that serve the same goal and some are unifinal meaning that they serve only a single goal uh, multi-final means might be something like walking to work with a friend which serves the goals of saving money on parking getting exercise and socializing that's an example of a multi-final means Equifinal means are multiple means to achieve the same goal. So like walking to work, um, hiking and swimming all serve the goal to exercise. And then a unifinal means might be like saving for retirement, uh, which is serving the one single goal of financial independence, but it's, it's not doing a whole lot for you. Um, multifinal means are efficient. And this is interesting. So it's like, if this is an optimization problem, you want as many multi-final means as possible, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's the engineer answer. But from the perspective of motivation, multi-final means can weaken the mental link between the top level abstract goal and its means, which can actually decrease your motivation to continue doing that activity. Crazy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so a goal system makes a relationship between means and goals easier to understand. Uh, it doesn't really tell you how to deal with conflicting goals though. Uh, and that's going to be a subjective decision, but there, there's some literature on this too. So, uh, resolving goal conflicts can be accomplished by prioritizing some goals over others or by compromising between goals. Uh, when you view a goal as central to your identity and there's a shaddy Fishbach and Simonson 2021 is the paper supporting this. Uh, or if you see it as a moral or ethical issue and Tetlock 2000 is supporting this. Uh, it makes sense to prioritize. So if you view a goal as central to your identity or see it as a moral or ethical issue, it makes sense to prioritize that goal. Uh, prioritization can also make sense when the marginal benefit of the actions toward the goal does not diminish. It's kind of hard to think about. So for example, the marginal benefit of exercising after you've already done your exercise for the day is pretty low. Uh, the marginal benefit of finishing an assignment that's due tomorrow is mm. high. Continuing to work on, on that mm -hmm. assignment at the expense of some other goal. Mm -hmm. um, and then when goals have decreasing marginal benefits, it makes sense to, to compromise. Uh, so that's, that's it. I, I hadn't thought a whole, a whole lot about a lot of that. It's, you know, it's, I don't even know if I should say this, but I'm going to say it so often I'll learn things and think to myself, wow, I can't believe that I've been giving people financial advice without knowing that. And it's always small. It's always small iterations in the grand scheme of things. Um, and, you know, there's, there's one paper from Morningstar talking about this, um, and, I, and I think it's got a lot of deficiencies. So it's not like this is an obvious thing, but you think about it, it's so, it's so important. But stuff like that happens all the time. It, it just, it blows my mind. And it's a great teaser for next week's interview. Isla was phenomenal conversation we had with her. Yeah, I, I agree. I thoroughly enjoyed that clearly because it inspired me to write yeah. a whole bunch of stuff and, and to really dig into her book, but also, um, into a lot of the papers that she, she references in her, in her book. And as we said, this research you're doing, it's going to be not one and done. You'll keep editing it over time as we learn more and meet more people and improve the yeah. study that you've done. Well, it, it'll scale too, right? That's the cool thing about it is if, if once we have a framework for um, a, a process for goal setting, I mean, even just the things that we talked about at the beginning, um, just the process of getting somebody to sit down and write out their objectives and then asking them to double that list of objectives and then presenting them with a list of categories and seeing if that spurs any more, right. any more objectives. Just that is relatively easy to implement with like I'm thinking about with, with PWL clients is relatively easy to implement and potentially has a massive, a massive impact. Um, so that, that scales, which is, which is exciting. Uh, in, in the David Blanchett 2015 paper that I mentioned, the utility model that, that he built, um, to kind of st stochastically, uh, determine the optimal goal funding, uh, procedure. I think we can, I think we can recreate something similar to that. And that's again, something that would scale and would be very cool. Cool. 
Well, it's also a great setup for our conversation right now with Heather Reisman to kick off the 22 and 22 challenge. Heather Reisman, welcome to the kickoff of the Rash Reminder 22 and 22 Reading Challenge. Happy to be here. Delighted we're, to be here. We're so excited to have you here. And honestly, I don't think we could have chosen a more perfect person to kick off this initiative. I mean, you're a you're literally a Canadian icon of reading to us. Well, that's a that's a wonderful uh, sobriquet, I would say, and uh, I'm very happy to have it. And yeah, I'm happy to be here. So it's pretty clear from your work and philanthropic efforts that you are on a mission to promote reading. So tell us, why do you think reading is so important? Well, first of all, there's the pure joy of reading. So if it was always important to have something that's a joyful activity, right now in the midst of this pandemic and what I think will be at least a year long recovery, there's just the pure joy of reading. So that, let's just start with that, the pure joy of reading. Um, And it's funny about that pure joy thing. Um, We live in a world where so much is uh, after our attention. And there's all this this stuff coming at us, coming at us, coming at us, that we can forget how much fun it is to open a book, get attracted by the first two paragraphs, and then get lost in an experience. So there's the pure joy of reading. But, you know, there's a lot else about reading. I mean, um, it's well known that reading builds empathy. It puts you in the shoes of other people, sometimes other people in your own country, but people from different walks of life, different circumstances, uh, whether it's fiction or it's nonfiction or it's memoir. In a great book, you get into the soul of the people you're reading about. And that just helps build empathy. And what do we need in this world? Mm. We need a greater amount of empathy, the ability to feel for others, to hear others, and to find ways for them to hear us. So so number two, it is just an amazing way to build empathy. Something which, you know, empathy, empathy helps live a purposeful life, it allows you to connect, it allows you to build relationships close to you and then in ever more outer concentric circles. So I just think it's amazing for empathy. Um, And then there's just a whole lot we could talk about and I don't know how much time you have today about the importance of reading for children and what that does to set children up for a lifetime ability to achieve their full potential. So to me, it's, it's just got everything. It has everything. Now, Heather, you influence the reading decisions of of a ton of people. I mean, like like Cameron said, you you're probably one of the most influential readers in in Canada through your Heather's Heather's picks. How do you though decide what to read? Um, it can be totally random and totally specific at the same time. That is, if someone I trust says to me, "You have to read this book." It could be a scientist doing work in an area I'm interested in that I happen to get to know over the years, or a best friend, or a member of our amazing reading team, or even a customer writing to me. I have all kinds of customers that write me and say, so it can be random from that Hmm. point of view. And then there are things I am interested in that cause me to go and um, search out books. So it could be totally random and it could be totally specific. Um, what I what I will say, because this is a question I get asked a lot, um, how do you read so much? Well, first of all, I don't read so much. I, I, I wonder if in this discussion, if the two of you read more than me. I am lucky I try to read a book a week. If it's an amazing week, I get two. But for the, if I'm on vacation, you know, maybe I can get to two or three books. But I probably only read in the course of a year, maybe 75 books. That's it. 10,000 new books come out every year. 10,000 in just in, in, you know, English language. And maybe that number has gone up since the last time I checked. So I I think people imagine much more. Um, But that's, you know, if you're reading 
75 books a year, you're reading. It could sound like a lot, but it's not that much. So I just want to say that. That's I probably read 75 to 100. I might start 200 or 250. Hmm. And so I'm at the point that if I start a book and if 15 pages or 20 pages in, I am not into the book. It's got to be a really special book or written by somebody really incredible hmm. to hold my attention past that. I have, to, I have to admit that. Now, if somebody off the charts and I'm just struggling with it a bit, I'll struggle longer, maybe up to 100 pages because my, my feeling will be maybe it's me that's not doing such a good job here. But in general, so I, I, I probably start, I might start 250 books, 275 hmm. books to get to 100 or 100 and Maybe it's a maybe maybe it's a little you know maybe it's a bit more but yeah. So our our challenge Heather is twenty two and twenty two, and I've had a number of listeners reach out and say, "Ooh, that's a lot. I'm not sure I could do that many." And that's fine, but you're talking about seventy five. Can you talk about what your daily habit is? Like, how long are you reading each day? Ah, I love your question. And by the way, you probably already covered this book, but do you know Atomic Habits by James Cleary? Okay, oh. you probably covered that. Yep. Okay. Um, you, 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 you use the operative word. The operative word is habit. So the first question one has to ask is, are they interested in reading? Do they want a reading habit? Like, do they want to? I've heard so many people say, I just wish I read more. Of the, th I have probably thousands of people have said that to me without exaggeration. Um, and I often think of those thousands, maybe more over these years, tens of thousands, there's some number who really do want to, and some number who may not really want to. To me, the difference is, and so I'm going to get to the habit part, is if you really want to. Like you have a story to tell about how you made this a habit. If you want to, and what you say is, but I just don't have the time. I always say to people like that to do what I do, and I do it a couple of times a year because I find it so illuminating about my own uh, potentially negative habits. I go through a couple of days and say, how much time am I spending surfing the net on Instagram, playing uh, Wordle, and I'm, I'm not giving up Wordle, I'm just telling you that, but um, <laughs> I, I know how much time I spend doing um, crossword puzzles, Wordle, um, spelling bee, like I wanna do those things, they're really fun, but they take time. So I go through and I say, what am I doing that I might be willing to sort of put aside? So that's number one. Number two, a really easy habit I've gotten into is uh, every time I work out, I try and I try and walk a minimum of 50 minutes a day, whether I'm walking to work or I'm, you know, walking in my neighborhood or walking on the treadmill, depending on the weather. I always have one book on the go on audio. I love mm. audio. I love audio. Actually, Indigo is going to do a lot with audio soon, uh, but I love audio. So I always have an audio book and I always have a a reading book and my reading book is I do that before I go to bed. That's two, two times. My habit is um, I don't take technology into my bedroom. I always have a book by the bed and I try and read a minimum of 15 minutes to a half hour by my bed. And then I read when I travel. So that's my habit. I read, if I'm flying, I read. If I'm, uh, going to bed every night, part of my ritual, it's my ritual to wind down and get myself disconnected. Like I, I it's really hard to disconnect. I'm so, I'm, I'm one of these people that loves my iPhone. So I don't bring it into my bedroom anymore. And uh, yeah, so that's my habit on the treadmill or when I'm walking, that's my favorite easy time. When I go to bed, such a wonderful ritual. And when I travel, that's my ritual. Hmm. You, you mentioned attention and, and you're just mentioning social media and, and the phone, the, the iPhone. Now you're involved with the production of The Social Dilemma, which I think a lot of people that are listening have probably seen. Uh, do, do you think that reading books helps with any of the mental health issues that stem from social media use? Well, let me say that, um, and thank you for mentioning Social Dilemma, because it was a real three and a half year labor of love. Huh. Um, let me say that uh, social media is addictive by design. It's, it's deliberately, deliberately touching a part of our brain 
which is a addictive part of our brain. All of us, we are all being addicted. Social, social media applications, uh, Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook, any of these platforms are deliberately, they know how to addict us. They track our, track our behavior, they know what we like to watch, and then they feed us more of that. Or the famous like button. That like button was all about addiction, all about addiction. So we're all addicted, and all of us, and I put up my hand like absolutely. Um, and I would just say, if you're conscious of it, you realize you're not controlling your own life. Somebody else is controlling your own life. And so if you want to live life on purpose, on whatever your own purpose is, there is no easier habit to build than a reading habit if you do it deliberately. And I think if you do it, you will find that you enhance your sense of calmness, your sense of ability to think. So do I think reading contributes? Yes. And in particular, reading long form. There's an amazing book you might want to bring to your readers. It's called Shallows, Shallow or Shallows. I can't remember because a while ago since I read it, about the importance of long form reading, right? And long form reading is good for our brains. Long form reading is good for our brains. It settles our brains. It allows us to think more clearly. It's calming. Long form reading is calming. So it's the joy of reading. It's the calming of reading and it exercises parts in our brain. It lights up parts in our brain that contribute to our well being. And that's just science. That's not me, that's science. So, so you were part of the creation and launch of the Kobo e reader. So, when someone asks you, Heather, should I read digitally or physical books? What do you say? I think it doesn't matter. I think if you're reading long form, any way that you're reading long form is great. Any way that you're reading long form is great. And, and as I say, I think listening to long form books is good too. I personally, here's what I can say. If I want to really remember stuff, particularly if I'm reading nonfiction, my brain, the way my brain works is if I read a physical book with a yellow highlighter, I retain more than if I read a digital book and highlight in digital. And then I, I retain more if I read a digital book and highlight than if I'm listening to audio. Hmm. And I find whenever I listen to audio, if I'm hearing something I want to remember, I literally have to stop in my tracks and play it over and over and over so that I can remember it. Hmm. So I don't know what other people find. And I, I haven't actually seen the latest research. There's a lot of research going on on this, but I can tell you my experience is physical book where I'm turning the pages and I'm experiencing the left-hand side and the right-hand side. I remember where I was in the book, what side of the page, where I read it, better than digital books and way better than audio. That's my experience. What's yours? Uh, we were just talking about this the other day, Cameron and I, offline. Uh, I, I often do audio book first. And if I find things that I like, that I wanna remember, like you were just mentioning, I'll go and purchase the ebook because then I can search, I can control F and find the, the thing that I wanted to remember and, it, and it's there. And then if I really like the book, I'll buy the physical hard copy to stick it on my, on my bookshelf. Okay. Um, and that's, like, from my point of view, reading is what's critical. I happen to be among the group of people, unfortunately there are a lot of them who do enjoy reading physical books and owning them. But uh, listen, I'm, what I'm here to say today is read and read long form um, because it just has so many joyful elements and so many benefits. Can you tell us about the mission of the Indigo Love of Reading Foundation? Yeah, so, uh, so glad you asked about that. Um, so uh, I'll tell you about the mission and to tell you about the mission, I have to tell you a little bit about the origin. Way back in 2002, I think 2002, I got a call one day from my uh, alderman saying that there was a school in my riding where I live, which was a high needs school and they just had a fire and they didn't have a lot of books and would I send over a box of books. And it was a quiet day, 2002 Indigo was a slightly smaller business, it was a quiet day and it's 
right around the corner from me. So I thought, oh, I'll just go over and see what their library looks like. I walked into a school in downtown Toronto, eight minutes from Eaton Center. So that's where it's located. And I almost fainted when I saw their library. Forget that there was a fire. They showed me pictures of what was in the library before and what they had left. They had a couple of cardboard boxes, even the books that they had kept from the fire. So they had all their books, but now they were singed. They had a few books, literally a few books in cardboard boxes. The average age of the book had to be 20 years old. I thought, how is this possible? Is it only this school? Well, that caused me, they had a most extraordinary principal, a PhD, a principal with a PhD, passionate about reading. She said, Heather, you can't imagine what's going on in high need schools. She said, all schools have no money for books, but in middle and upper class, the parents are helping the libraries get books. And anyway, they have books at home. In high need schools, often they don't have them at home and the schools have none. That led to our decision to learn more about it and then to found the Indigo Love of Reading Foundation. And our mission is to provide as many high need schools in the country as we can with sufficient books to enrich their libraries. And what we did was, and this was an astounding fact that we found, do you know that way back before either of you was born, but I was around, in the 1960s and 70s, and even up to the early 80s, the average public school got three new books per kid per year for their library. So if they had 200 kids, they got 600 books, new ones to keep refreshing the library. I defy you to guess what the current percentage is. Take a crazy number. It's, I mean, now books are more important, right? What do you think? All right, I'll tell you, because <laughs> you won't guess. <laughs> Less than a third of a book per kid in high need oh. schools all across this country. Wow. So our short-term mission, raise on debt, is with the money we contribute and the money that our customers help us contribute to give as many high need schools in the country every year to bring them up to the level that they used to be in the mm -hmm. 60s and 70s, right? to, to replenish their library. And we make a three-year commitment and we contribute anywhere from 50 to $150,000 against their current budgets of anywhere, you won't believe this, from $50 to 250 wow. a year. Some get up to a thousand if they've got like a thousand kids or you know 800 kids. So that's, that's our short-term mission, but our vision is to have this problem so well understood that provincial governments will make it absolutely a priority for high needs schools to be richly equipped with books. Now this, I'm gonna give you a statistic that the two of you are gonna love and you're gonna do something with. And I challenge you to do something with this. Today, 30, roughly 34% of adult Canadians are functionally illiterate meaning they don't have enough literacy to fill out an application form uh, to critically read a newspaper. And you're going to think, well, are those mostly immigrants? No, they're not. Hmm. They're mostly not immigrants. They're mostly Canadians, hmm. right? For every 1% that we increase the literacy rate in this country, we add $16 billion to the economy over the lifetime of that cohort. Hmm. Wow. Now imagine, and I invite you to join me in solving this problem. Wow. So that's what the Love of Reading Foundation is about. And uh, so far we've put close to $30 million into schools in this wow. country. Hmm. And, I'm, and I'm proud to say it's the most significant amount of money that's been put into li high needs libraries in school in the history of the country. And, you know, I, I, I do say that with pride. Good wow. for you. So you're here to help us launch an online reading challenge for our podcast community. How do you think about a community and how a community might help someone who does want to read more? Uh, you're saying, how does a community help somebody? Yeah. It's, um, it's hard to think about it at the community level because what's the organizing principle? Like, how is the community organizing? Like what would be the vehicle through which a given community would organize? Would someone in the community become 
the sort of the leader, the captain and trying to get other people to do it and then to understand the issues and then to decide how they, like what would the organizing principle be? So it's going to be a website. It is a website where people commit to reading a certain number of books. They're, they're basically making a public commitment to accept this challenge. And then as they, on the individual levels, as they go through the challenge, they're going to get rewards and acknowledgement from other, those of us in the group. So it's about making a public commitment. Oh, okay. So you're really saying you're, you're considering Canada, the community, or maybe it's beyond Canada, and you're going to create this wonderfully interactive website, and you're going to inspire people through the communication and content on this website. Is that right. what we're doing? Exactly. Okay. Well, listen, the more exciting the content is, um, the more people have a chance to share their point of view about what they love to read, the more you can organize by passions. I, we do find that if someone is really interested in um, learning how to live green, live in, in concert with the environment, they're gonna wanna know what's worth reading, what's worth looking at, what's worth watching. So I, 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 we've generally found that two things inspire reading. If you can help people access around the things they're passionate about and then talk to each other. Like I'm a massive fan of book clubs. I belong to a book club all my life, um, hmm. more than one. Like I'm not in the same book club I was in high school, but literally my first book club, I was in grade seven. And you can tell it's a long time since I was in grade seven. So I think if you can create digital book clubs where people can, you know, talk online and, and engage in their own little book club, I just think it would be phenomenal. Yeah. Passions, well, book, book clubs, like-minded people, exchanging views. Yeah. Recommendations. Well, what words of parting advice do you have for listeners who are, have an objective of reading more this year? Well, I think um, the point you made right at the beginning, there's nothing like being deliberate about a habit. I love James Cleary's idea of atomic steps, meaning little tiny steps. So if, you, if you're going to suddenly commit to reading 200 books, you may, there could be the odd person who can really do it. But uh, whatever your current reality is, if you bump that up, you know, if you were reading two books a year and you're going to say, you know, I'm going to try and do one a month. That would be massive progress. So I think setting a reasonable target and then making it a habit and reinforcing a habit, you know, finding what's the time of day. If you read just 10 minutes every night, by the end of the 30, 30 days in the month, you got your book done. So when, you know, do you wanna do it in the gym? Do you wanna do it at night? Do you wanna do it, you take the, the subway to work? Um, I think it's, it's, declaring a habit. And that's why I was so, uh, Cameron, I was so inspired by you, your decision to get up in the morning and read. When do you read? I read from 5 to 6.15. And to your point, Heather, it doesn't take a lot of time to go through the books. Like I read an hour, hour and 15. And I've already read eight books this year. Like the, the books just melt away. Yeah, some days I've read longer, but you get that atomic habit. And by the way, Atomic Habits is on our 22 recommended books for 22. The books just happen. It's just the daily habit. Yeah, it's just the daily habit. And and then it's a priority, right? And I, I'll just tell you this in, in closing that, um, you know, one of the things that James Cleary talks about is habit stacking. So find something you love to do. Like I love to play Wordle and um, I love to do crosswords. So if there's something I'm trying to build a habit on, in my case, I'm trying to extend my meditation time. I say, okay, I'm not going to let myself do this puzzle until I've done my meditation. And it's really worked. So I think if wow. someone's trying to build a reading habit, what is, what is something that you just love to do with all your might? And if you say, okay, I'm going to get to do that thing I love, but first I'm going to do 10 minutes or 15 minutes of reading or, and maybe falling asleep is your favorite thing. So you do it before. Um, bedtime is just a great, right? Because reading before you go to sleep accomplishes so much. Um, all again, the research says it allows you to wind down. And if I would, you know, if I combine my passion for reading with the social dilemma, I would just say nothing, I think nothing can be as transformative and supportive of your reading habit as not bringing your phone into the bedroom. Hmm. Bring your book to bed. 
I agree. Heather, this has been a great conversation. Thanks for kicking off this challenge. Again, it could not have been a better guest. So thank you so much. You're so welcome. My pleasure. And thank you for all you're doing to encourage reading. Thank you. Thanks everyone for listening this week.